Stay hungry, stay foolish. Today is episode 300 of the Innovation Show and we're six years in. We haven't missed a show in six years and it's been an absolute pleasure. And I want to thank you, the listener, those people who have been with us over a long period of time and indeed those people who are just joining us, you are very welcome. I talk a lot on the show about the idea of serendipity and how these beautiful coincidences happen on a regular basis. One of those has just happened for us where we secured a 12-month sponsor for the show. The show has always been about bringing you ideas and authors from all over the globe who innovate within their specific areas of expertise. It makes sense then for us to partner with a brand that does the same thing. Zai is a brand that innovates within their area of expertise. They're a global fintech that built integrated financial services for digital native and non-native businesses, and it's a pleasure to be their partner. You can find out more about Zai, and please check them out on www.hellozai.com. Because of Zai, we can invest further in the show and bring you increased quantity and higher quality, including the equipment on which we record the show. Today's show is recorded on some of that equipment. I need to figure out how to use the rest. But without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Today's guest combines recent advances in neuroscience, psychology, behavioral economics, and education with key research on high-performance businesses to create an actionable blueprint for becoming a leading-edge learning organization. His book examines the process of learning from an individual and organizational standpoint. From an individual perspective, the book discusses the cognitive, emotional, motivational, attitudinal, and behavioral factors that promote better learning. Organizationally, it focuses on the kinds of structures, culture, leadership, employee learning behaviors, and human resource policies that are necessary to create an environment that enables critical and innovative thinking. His work also provides strategies to mitigate the reality that humans can be reflexive, lazy thinkers who seek confirmation of what they believe to be true and affirmation of their self-image. It is always a great pleasure to welcome a great friend of the Innovation Show, a great friend of mine that I've come to know over the years and I consider a great gift from the universe. We've become virtual friends, still yet to meet in person. Ed Hess, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful being with you, my friend. Wonderful. A, a virtual hug to you through the through the camera, man. A virtual hug. Ed, Humility is the New Smart was your emotions book. We covered that before on the show. A very, very popular show. Hyper Learning is your behavioral and philosophy book. We covered that on the show before as well. And I went back in time. I said to you, I was so impressed and intrigued by your work that I wanted to go back into time. And now we're on learn or die. So I've I've been going backwards as you've written them forwards. And this is your science book, as you call it. I absolutely love it. And in your typical humble style, you pose the question that there have been scores of books published on the subject of learning organizations. So why do we need a new book? And I'll let you answer that because you do that brilliantly You introduce the need for this book in this age of rapid change. Exactly right. We're in an age of rapid change, and that change is going to continue to accelerate. And the change is different this time because the change impacts human beings and the type of work they're going to be able needed for. Technology is is continuing to advance and get smarter and smarter. And people in the in the workplace are going to have to be able to add value in ways that technology can't add value. And that, generally speaking, is higher order thinking, creative, imaginative thinking, making decisions when there's not a lot of data, exploring the unknown, figuring things out. All right. Moral judgment thinking and being able to connect and relate to other human beings in in a way that is emotionally positive, which is able to create caring, trusting teams that can be highly, highly innovative, good learners because of high team performance. And so technology is driving all of this. And it means that the easy type of stuff, the linear thinking, the linear learning, 
is going to be done by technology. So it's the complex type of thinking, and the complex type of thinking only occurs when people learn, because it's generally dealing more with there's not a lot of data. If there's a lot of data, the technology is going to swoop it all up, come out with answers much, much faster and much more reliably than us human beings. And so it's the type of thinking that humans are going to be needed, the type of adaptation. And all of that, if you think about it, in order to think differently, in order to learn new things, in order to, you know, go into the unknown and explore, what is, what is that all about? That's all about nothing but learning, all right? And when most of us were children, we were excellent learners. Think about when you were a child, all right, and learning to ride a bicycle. You know, you had a bicycle, maybe it was a two-wheel, maybe you had little training wheels, all right? There's training wheels, you try to get on by yourself. If it was a two-wheel, somebody held it, you got on, they gave you just a little push, and what happened? You sort of weaved and what, and then you fell off. What did you do? You dusted yourself off, there may have been some tears, and you got on the bike again, and you went a little further. It was iterative learning, learn by doing, all right? Having the courage, the resilience, that's what's going to, in the workplace, in the workplace going forward, most of the work that human beings will be doing will be work where it's more mistake oriented than it is, if you will, A to B, all right? It's, it's not going to be the same thing. If it's the same thing over and over, technology's going to do it. You're only needed to do stuff the technology can't do. Same thing with people that are in the service industries, okay? If it doesn't involve dealing with human beings, the technology is going to do it. But if it involves dealing with human beings and we have to emotionally connect with each other, we have to relate, we have to listen to each other, I have to try to understand you because you're the customer and the customer is always right, not me, all right, to be able to serve you. We're going into a time where everybody's going to have to take their learning game to a higher level. There's so much research in this book, and I, I experienced that with your later books as well. But going back here, your interviews with people, the case studies you have in the book, the amount of reading you did and the extensive bibliography and index that you have at the back of the book, the appendix, everything. And you say through a synthesis of this research on learning, management and education and building your own experience, building on your own experiences, and all the established science in the field, you come up with a formula. And I mentioned this in the introduction, this blueprint, and it involves what you call a HPLO, a high performance learning organization, which I absolutely love. We'll go into what the key elements of that is in a little while. But let's explain first what a HPLO is. A high performance learning organization is an organization designed to attract the right people or to train the right people, all right? They create the right environment which makes that possible and they use the right processes on a daily basis in order to be good learners. So it takes people, people with the right mindsets, people that want to learn, people that are comfortable learning, but it takes the right environment to overcome, help people overcome our natural way of being. We're not naturally good learners, all right? We are outstanding confirmation-seeking learners. We go out in the world and we see what we believe. And if we, we don't see things which we disbelieve. And we're very, it's diff, very difficult for us to change and update our learning because we've identified with our learning because our learning is how we were called smart. And all of that has to become is going to be changed and it happens in an organization because nobody can achieve excellence by themselves. Almost all higher level learning, we need others to help us learn. We need others to ask us questions. We need others to challenge us. But what, what basis are you saying that, Ed? What's, what's your data? Okay. Uh, do you have enough data? Did you look for disconfirming data? All right. What process did you go through? 
And when, when, when most of us talk about learning and we're in, whether we're in meetings or in working and everything, things just pop into our minds and we do it. We don't evaluate it. We don't double check it. Now, a lot of things you don't have to, but on things that are involved, either big decisions, complex decisions, innovation, something new, not being able to understand, if you will, items coming from different disciplines. It, it all comes down to you got to have the right people, but they're just not out there. You just don't go pick them. Most organizations have to develop the people, and so they got to have the right environment. And having the right environment and development requires you use the right processes. People don't learn things by just reading something in a book. People learn things by actually extracting the learning and coming up and changing it into how am I going to behave in order to be that way and change my behaviors, improve my behaviors. What processes do I use to manage myself, to grade myself, to improve myself? And so that's the, if you will, the right people. I got the right mindsets. Okay. I want to learn, et cetera. I got the right environment. I got the right culture and I got the right processes. And then the next thing I had to just close off the introduction and how you introduced the book and what I mentioned in the introduction to today's show is then there's just our frailties as thinkers and what what we call mental models and or or as you call it, I love this, our ego defense systems. These are the ways in which we deny or distort reality to protect ourselves from anxiety or fears. And you say because our human operating systems have successfully allowed us to navigate the world, including our jobs, it takes a huge effort to change them, which is exactly what is needed in order to learn. And this is why you mentioned those people who will challenge us and us actually seeking out that information. This is a crucial skill and you devote a, an entire section to this, including our biases, but also then ways we can hack our biases and hack this weakness that we have in our human operating systems. Let's let's go slowly and talk about what are the two big inhibitors. Ego and fear. Ego and fears, two biggest inhibitors to learning. Ego comes down to, you know, most people who are watching this have probably, you know, gone to college. Um, many people in business and they've got in good companies or entrepreneurs, people are successful, let's just say generally. All right. And so they've identified, they have a story about themselves, their ego. And in most cases, people have come up through a system and, and learned that they were smart because they got good grades. All right. And they identified with those good grades and therefore they are smart and that they know. And so they basically, when people challenge what they know, they get defensive. They don't search for what they don't know because they don't have to because I'm so smart and I got this great job and I'm doing well and I'm getting good feedback and I got a bonus. All right. So the way people define themselves through their ego is a big, big in, in, inhibitor. And then the biggest inhibitor is fear. Fear of looking bad, fear of failure, fear of not being liked, etc. And Organizations can help transform ego through process and through education, but it, all of the ego work really has to be done in, internally. Fear in so many places comes from the, is, is enabled by the organization. Command and control, direct, okay, uh, leaders, managers that basically don't emotionally engage with the people that they're working with and working for and having a competitive environment, okay, that I'm competing with you, and all right, there's going to be one opening, you know, a vice president of XYZ, and you're, you're, you know, there's three of us that are basically in competition. I mean, if I see you doing something wrong, do you think I'm going to help you, and vice versa? Well, because we're friends, I would, but in the real world, that doesn't happen that much. So this thing about fear, fear of looking bad, fear of not knowing, fear of not being liked, fear of not getting promoted, fear of my losing my job. And fear, all right, can come internally 
but it's heavily influenced by the business environment, by the culture and how leaders and managers behave. And so to overcome that, okay, that's the right type of environment that only the company leadership can put in place and they have to behave that way in role model. They can't basically, you know, come up with it. We're going to, we're going to be a, we want you to be, to trust each other. All right. Well, how do you do that? Okay. How do you do that? Oh, well, I mean, you got to find some ways to behave. We're going to make, agree how we're going to behave. Well, how are we going to help each other do that? You know, people don't get down into the granular stuff that learning is ultimately behavioral. Learning is ultimately, if you will, taking ownership of what's going on inside ourselves and learning to manage it, okay? So that's the challenges that we have in the going forward in high-performance companies and the research is overwhelming over the last 30 to 40 years of so the books on high-performance companies. It really comes down to how people are treated in the workplace. It really comes down to high employee engagement. It really comes down to people not being so competitive inside the company. You can compete with your competitor, but inside the company, it needs to be an environment that's going to produce the best ideas, all right, the best innovation, the best products, the best services. And, and that is that's go, that happens in teams and et cetera. So it's it's complex, but it's simple. It's complex and it's simple. I got to take ownership of my inner world and my ego. I got to manage my fear. I got to use processes to do this. And I got to basically learn how to collaborate and excel working in teams. One of the things that I find and you found as well, I've covered lots of shows on bias, because I'm fascinated by these biases that we have as uh, just as being human, if you're human, you're biased. But even if you use the word bias, there's a bias towards it, where people sometimes feel you're saying they're broken. And, and I think this is why I love the work we do, where it's about giving people information in a non intrusive, non judgmental way, and let them make their own decisions. Because one of the things that's so essential for a HPLO is an understanding that while we may be the king of the planet, if you want to call us that from a from from an ownership of the planet perspective, you know, and we're not doing that great a job, right? <laughs> but we're animals, and animals are emotional creatures. And we have this fallacy where we actually think we're rational thinkers. And there's this myth you talk about the myth of rationality. We are heavily emotionally. All right, emotional people. Emotions are basically integral in everything we do. There is not a rational part of me an emotional part of me. The emotional is intertwined. It's intertwined in the, the emotional influences what I see, what I hear. The emotional influences what I speak, how I speak, how I connect with people. Um, people, I think that all through history, in at least the Western world, and this is a, maybe that's too broad a statement, there's a significant time during our history in the Western world, we have downplayed emotions. All right. Emotions are bad. I remember my first first job, my first job in New York City. Uh, first day I got taken to my boss and, you know, he has his office and he walks me in and he closes the door and says, sit down, son. And I sat down and everything. You know, he's probably was at that time 30 years older than me. He says, you turn around, see that door. And I'm saying to myself, this is weird. Yeah, I see the door. <laughs> That's where you leave your emotions. You do not belong. You do not bring your emotions in the workplace. There is no place for emotions in the workplace. You are here to perform. Okay. And the fact of the matter is, you know, and I, I heard him and I wasn't necessarily surprised, 
But I didn't even think about the fact that he was crazy, that that's not possible, because at that time I didn't know that much about emotions, etc. And But the fact of the matter is, is they're integral. They influence everything that we basically manifest through our behaviors. All right? They are intertwined in our brain. They influence what we react to. They influence the degree of our reaction. They influence, they are basically the certain types of emotions will generate, if you will, I'll call them the warm feelings that open people up to each other. Other emotions are fear. And fear, everyone is fearful. It's just a matter of degree and it's a matter of how you manage it. All right. And people can manage their fears. All right. And people can basically take ownership of their emotions. All right. I mean, when I was growing up, no one talked about emotions. I mean, when I was in, in my early years in graduate school, it was all just talking about cognitive psychology. All right. Emotional psychology wasn't really on, on, on the table. It's how you think. All right. And don't let your emotions mess up how you think. Well, wait a minute. It's all integral. They're already there. So they're either going to be positive, negative or neutral. And most of the times in human beings, they're not neutral. OK, they're not neutral. So the, the, you're, you're quite correct. Managing your emotions, being attuned to your emotions and being able to generate positive emotions is a huge plus in the workplace and being able to not let negative emotions run wild inside of you and control you unless you're in a real serious situation, life or death, something out there where emotions, you know, negative emotions, fear is justified. But we're talking about in the workplace and it shouldn't, there should never be fear in the workplace if you're working with the right people. Now I'm going back to the hyper learning. If you're working with the right people in the right environment, the goal there is to eradicate or minimize fear as much as possible. Only then will you have consistent high performance in learning. The next part will be of particular interest for HR professionals and hiring managers in particular because you dedicate an entire chapter to the people part of the HBLO formula. You approach this element from different perspectives. One is the learning mindset of employees themselves, self-efficacy and self-determination, and the mindset that managers and leaders have about employees. You tell us that, that, that while having the right people is necessary to create a high-performance learning organization, you must also have the right kind of environment. So we'll move on to that in a second. But let's talk about the people part first. The First, the people, the mindsets, and then actually the approach of management towards the people. You want people that basically have a learning mindset. And there's two, uh, really, two theories out there that, that approach that. One, the growth mindset by Carol Dweck. Uh, that's a, 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 you know, that's a mind, mindset which basically motivates growth or in, the, in the sense that I'm willing to try. I understand that it's, a, uh, it's an iterative process. I stay positive. I'm resilient. I have courage to try. When I fail, I don't let it overcome me. I try to learn from my failures. And most importantly, I try not to make the same mistake twice. All right. So I'm actually learning. So I have a uh, and I find growth. Uh, I'm curious. All right. I'm curious. I, I like to learn that type of positive mindset. The other mindset that's out there is the one that that uh, I created, the new smart mindset, if you will. And uh, uh, that basically, you know, hits head on this aspect of getting good grades in school and says, OK, everybody feels good if they got the good high grades. And the new smart mindset is basically five, five principles. And, I've, you know, I, I'm defined not by what I know or how much I know, but by the quality, quality of my thinking, listening, relating and collaborating. My mental models, my story about the world it's not reality. It's only my story about my world because I see things. You and I can be going down the street and look at the same thing happening. And you will see different things than I see. 
and you won't see what I see, and vice versa, all right? We basically believe, though, our stories are the truth, well, they're not. They're only our stories of what we see. The neuroscience is clear. We go out in the world and we see what we believe. And we only process about 0.1% of the stimuli that comes in our bodies. So we see what we believe because we are so wrapped up in what we believe and believe so strongly it is correct and right. All right. We get to the point that we identify with that, and I'm, I am my ideas. I am my ideas. Well, the next part of the new smart is I'm not my ideas. I must decouple my ideas, not my values, my ideas, from my ego. I don't define myself by what I know. I define myself as being a good learner. I don't define myself because I know more algebra than you know, or I know more history or I know more technology. No, I define myself. I get the positive emotional feelings that I'm a good learner. I'm a good learner. I'm a good listener. I'm a good collaborator. I'm a good explorer, etc. I must be open-minded and treat what I believe is just a hypothesis to be constantly stress test. The world is changing. Impermanence is a dominant theory, always has been, of the world. Things are changing. And knowledge is getting created now through technology, big data, etc., faster and faster. The shelf life of knowledge now is two to three years. So think about it. You know, somebody goes to college and they're out in the world working five years later a lot of that knowledge has changed. So, one, how do they learn? They're going to basically quit working and go back and spend four more years in college? I don't think so. Most people can't afford that. Oh, I got to learn and work. I got to learn and work at the same time. Yeah, so I need to learn the things that impacts my work first, correct? Yeah, if you want to keep your job. All right. And I need to learn things to be able to do things that the smart machines won't be able to do and the smart robots won't be able to do. Right. Yeah. OK. Ooh, that's the higher order thinking stuff or that's the emotionally engaging with other human beings. Wow. I never done any work in the emotions. How do you emotionally engage with people? How do you connect and relate and build trusting relationships? And as you see how this all goes, what you find is, is that Emotions are integral to human success in the digital age. Emotions are integral. And so I, as, as you know, I'm working on a project on a course, soft skills for the digital age. And I tell people the soft skills, which generally are emotionally laden, all right, they can be, they can be behaviorally manifested by behaviors, but they're basically emotionally laden. Okay, soft skills are the hard skills. And you know, and how many of us have been taught soft skills? Even with my children, I was telling you beforehand, I really work hard to not just teach them the skills, but to teach them why I'm teaching them the skills. So I'm kind of going, I'm like going, guys, this is like a superpower. You're going to be like a superhero who has these skills. Don't tell people about your skills. You don't have to say that to them because, you know, they might be mocked for it. So I would want them to believe this is like they have x-ray vision or something like that. And uh, so I was telling you each night we do breathing. You and I practice that breathing. But also and, and actually the, the breath, the four, seven, eight breath for anybody listening is magnificent where you you breathe out first for, you know, empty your lungs, then you breathe in for four, hold for seven, and then forcefully blow out through your lips for eight. And I do four cycles of that twice a day with them. And over a period of six months, it changes how you actually think. So it'll change your next experience, whatever that is. But also if you're stressed, it's a great way to actually just wipe the slate clean. And I just wanted to mention that because I know you practice that. But the other one was then a more recent one, which is gratitude to train their brains again towards away from the negativity bias that we naturally have as humans as well. And um, so I, anyway, I just wanted to mention that because I think it's useful for people to know that this is not this is not beyond 
capture that that actually we can do some very small practices to to be able to do this so ed any have you anything to share before i go on about your own practices that you because i know you have many of them i think i think the other thing that that's important vis-a-vis from the concept of learn learn or die is is focusing on the you know what what's the essence of, of, a, of a working organization, this is for HR and, and, and human development people. The, in, there's been eight or nine studies done the last 40 years on high performance organizations. Uh, Tom Peters and Waterman was the first one in 1982, but um, you know, Collins and Porus, and then Jim did his own book, and then there's a book out of Dartmouth, and then uh, uh, O'Reilly and Pfeffer from Stanford, and uh, I have my my book, and what's so f- fascinating is that all of us found the same, if you will, system and systems and processes in companies which create high performance, and it it really comes down to four things, five things. The organization has a higher purpose than just profits. Profits are necessary but it has a higher purpose, which creates meaning with people. They have a culture of constant improvement by learning, high employee engagement, okay? The most recent Gallup poll shows that 85% of the workers that they polled in the world are not highly engaged in their work, 85%. High employee engagement is mission critical in the digital age. Humble, passionate, values-based leaders. Humble, passionate, they believe in the mission, they believe in the purpose, but values-based leaders who exhibit and behave the way they talk. It's talk is cheap. It's through behaviors that you manifest your beliefs. And all of these companies have a practical approach, okay? They have processes that they use on a daily basis to basically drive the behaviors that are going to enable people to basically feel valued. And the two big psychological principles that have to be manifest in an organization, three really, psychological safety, Amy Edmondson's great work, Okay, self-determination theory, all right, and positivity, the whole area of positive psychology. And the one which people, everybody sort of gets the positivity a little bit. Uh, Everybody knows about uh, psychological safety. Self-determination theory is not given its due. It's not given its due. And it's self-determination theory is meeting the needs of the other person, the needs of employees, okay? And, you know, what are those needs? People have a basic needs for autonomy, to be respected, to have input on what they do, to have the opportunity to express their views as to how their job is done, to give feedback. They want to be feel valued as a human being that is not just a cog in a wheel. I'm an autonomous individual and I have some choice in what I do. Give me choice as to what I do. They have, people have best friends at work. If you have a group that's so competitive that nobody trusts each other and people don't have best friends at work, you're not going to have a high performance learning organization. And the last one is give people the opportunity to to grow and advance and be all they can be. And a company that historically has been world class, and that's United Parcel Services. Every employee, no matter where, from the loading dock to the, you know, in, in UPS's executive headquarters, the last time I was there, the senior executives are not at the top of the, the of the skyscraper, so to speak. They're in the middle. Senior executives at UPS all have the same office, 
They, they share administrative assistances. There is no executive dining room. They have no limousines or drivers, and UPS has no private jets. Leaders fly, eat, get to work. There's no special parking places. All right. And, you know, that's a company that's over, gosh, it was formed in 1907. It's got $85 billion worth of revenue, but it was built based on the founders. The founders, Jim Casey's philosophy still exists there. The founder's philosophy of treat every person as a human being and our job is to help people be all they can be. And that's why the free agent, if you're working at UPS and you want to work somewhere else, there's no battle between managers as to whether you can do that. As fast as we can, we meet your needs. When UPS went public, there were more millionaire truck drivers from UPS than the history of the truck driving industry for employees in probably the world. Because UPS, all employees had stock, had the opportunity, and, and their turnover is so low. And so if you think about it, what brings people together? And it's this, I feel safe with you. You care about me. I'm treated as a unique human being. I have some autonomy. I got friends at work. And I got the chance to be all I can be. I mean, 50 years of research says that's the secret formula. <laughs> it's not rocket science. It's not neuroscience. And why are there so few companies that are continuous or con continuous high performers? From the lack of execution, from the lack of leaders beh behaving, from the lack of belief, and in the lack, if you will, in, in approaching, uh, you know, it's sort of like the, uh, you know, how do I feel about the people that, that work for me? Okay. I mean, that's the, that's the, uh, the, the concept. I mean, uh, am I better than them, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is, what's, what's going on here? And I think that's the, those are the things that goes back to McGregor's theory X, theory Y leadership. Okay. Theory X employees are lazy. They're not very bright. And if I give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. And if I'm not hounding them, they're not going to do their job. Theory why employees want to make a contribution. They want to be successful. They want to learn. They want to be better. They want to be part of a great team. Is it a positive attitude towards your employees or is it a negative attitude? If it's a negative attitude in the digital age, sayonara. And they feel it as well. Ed. You know, you mentioned about the authentic leader there that's doing more than talking the talk. They're walking the talk. And then that part as well about how do you treat them? I, I, you know, we know about gut feeling and we'll talk about Gary Klein's work in a little while about intuition, etc. But I, I, we have a detection system, whether it's the amygdala or some part of the brain or the gut, the brain in the gut, that we can feel the inauthenticity from people. So when somebody you, spouts out words like that, we can sense it off them and we can sense the theory X and the theory Y of people. And I think that's a uh, that's why we're seeing the great resignation. A lot of leaders, so-called leaders, didn't step up during the time of crisis. There's a great saying that any turkey can fly in a storm. So when times are good, it's easy to talk a great game. But when times aren't so good, when you're in a crisis, you really see who is walking the talk. It always was important. All right. It's going to be mega important in the digital age because... In most industries, the human component is going to shrink because technology will be taking over more work, all right, either through technology, just raw technology or robots. So it's even more important if you want to have the best human component. You got the technology, you got the robots. If you want the best human component of your company, it all 
depends upon how you treat people. If you have time, I'll tell you a short, real short story. Uh, a, a gentleman that I was very fortunate to meet, uh, he lived in a not, not, not tiny town, but a mid-sized town in rural Georgia. Uh, his, his family, back in the early 1900s, were one of the investors who basically bought the uh, formula from a pharmacist for what became the Coca-Cola company. And so his family never was in the company, uh, in the sense working the company, but in the beginning, and for quite a while, they owned half of Coca-Cola. And he served on the board. And the gentleman's name was that I'm talking about is, is Bill, Bill Turner. Uh, Bill was, was a wonderful man, and I, I write about him in my hyper-learning book. Uh, he's passed away. Uh, he sat on the board of Coca-Cola a lot, of, a long time, and he funded about 24 servant leadership centers at different universities across the United States. And I was with Bill one time in his office in uh, Columbus, Georgia, and he had a very small office, um, and he had all of his things from, he went to Georgia Tech, he was an engineer, you know, all his mementos, but it was very small. His furniture was probably 40 years old. You know, he was just just himself. And I said, Mr. Bill, and I always called him Mr. Bill because I was so respectful. I mean, he was so much older than me, and, and he kept telling me, just call me Bill. And I just said, I don't know why I can't do it. And he says, okay, I'm not going to answer your question. I said, okay, Bill, I got a question for you. He says, you've seen it. You've seen it all. You've built two great companies. You've been inside Coca-Cola all your life. You've done this, this, and this, and this. What's the secret to building a great company? And he rocked back in his chair and put his hands just like this. Rocked his head thinking, and then leaned forward. And he says, Ed, it's real simple. Everyone just wants to be loved. And he was talking about platonic love, not sex. Everyone wants to be loved. He says, if you treat people the right way, they'll go through doors for you. And if you think about it, what's the result of psychological safety in self-determination theory, in positive emotions? We talk about now in modern times, you got to have caring, trusting teams. Okay? Caring, trusting. Okay? So I don't know how you define platonic love, but I, I would guess that caring and trusting someone is part of it okay so but it was so interesting it's very simple everyone just wants to be loved so it's how you treat human beings how you treat do you treat them as cogs in your wheel Do you treat them as machines or you treat them as unique human beings do you give them the benefit of the doubt until proven otherwise that they want to be successful, they want to make a contribution, they want to help the company, they want to be good at what they do, they want their family to be proud of them, instead of all this negativity, all right? Uh, and, and that's what's sort of so fascinating when you put all of this work together from various disciplines, it all comes down to how people feel and how people behave. One of those people who's foundational, I'm going to mention it because you originally sent me down this rabbit hole it was the work of Carl Rogers. And I sent you the other day, a beautiful quote that I took from his book, A Way of Being. And it was so on point. It was something that I expected to read in your book, because it was so on point of in a digital age in a smart machine age, we need to be in control as much as we can of our being, because our being means higher levels of thinking, higher levels of empathy, of treating others, and in return, then the, that circular process of them being feeling secure enough to maybe tell us we're off track, etc. But I wanted to quote this, and then maybe that will set you up to share your thoughts on Rogers, because I'd love to have him on the show, may you rest in peace. But he said, when I can permit realness in myself or sense it or permit it in another, I am very satisfied. When I am able to let myself be congruent and genuine, 
I often help the other person. When the other person is transparently real and congruent, he often helps me. In those rare moments when a deep realness in one meets a real realness in the other, a memorable I thou relationship, as Martin Buber would call it, occurs. Such a deep and mutual personal encounter does not happen often, but I am convinced that unless it happens occasionally, we are not living as human beings. And I sent that to you for multiple reasons. One is because I I sense that from our conversations all the time, there's a a respect and a, a learning and a, a deep listening that occurs during those moments. And I share for that reasons, but also I thought it was very apt to your work. Of course you knew it and you had studied Rogers deeply and he had a massive impact on your career. Carl Rogers, is, uh, his work has been impactful on on my career and my, my philosophy and uh, it was a very, uh, you know, I was a very fortunate one of his um, doctoral students and everything that he trained under was a professor in the school that I was at and you know so I was deep into Carl Rogers philosophy and if, if you think about what if you think about the ultimate the ultimate let's say conversation between two people or the ultimate team conversation it goes back to my uh, concept which is un- and underlies uh, as part of Carl Rogers' work is inner peace. When 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 people trust each other and care about them as unique human beings, and when people have taken ownership of their mind and their ego and their emotions and their body, so they can manage themselves, the highest levels of conversations come about when we are still inside, we're quiet inside, we are open to the other person and what they're saying. Our mind is quiet, we're not judging, we're not critiquing, we're not making up our answer. Our mind is not wandering. We are 120% in the moment. It's like being in a state of flow. Uh, if you're an athlete or, or a dancer, we're in a state of flow, you and I talking, or or collaboration teams in a state of collective flow. We are all fully in. We're non-judgmental. We're not being reactive. All right. We're not. We're not. We're not thinking up our answer while you're talking. We're not leaning forward as we hear your voice going down, getting ready to attack, or debate, or speak, <laughs> or whatever. We're letting it just flow, and it's very similar to emergent thinking. Uh, from uh, uh, Brian Arthur at the Santa Fe Institute. Our best thinking, our best being comes when things just, we're quiet and things emerge. And that allows us to access not only our conscious brain, but our subconscious in our body. And we're also listening to our body and our body is very smart. It's not just a, you know, piece of, you know, whatever muscle and, and our body has, quote, intuition, feels. That's how we get. And so that's what Carl Rogers is talk about, talking about. The ultimate listening is, is that when I'm quiet and taking in and listening, and then when you're through, instead of responding, I ask you some questions or I make statements. Let me make sure I understood what you, what you meant by this. This is what I heard. Is that what you meant? Or I'm not sure I understood. Let me tell you what I heard. And then you tell me where I'm wrong before I'm coming back in agreeing, disagreeing. And in the business world, trying to basically say, well, you forgot this or you should have thought of that. Or did you think of this? No, you shoot. I'm going to show you that I really was listening to you. Okay. And through that, you get into a conversation, all right? And you know, these conversations that when you have, when you're sort of really one to one, it can be more than one person, but when you're really quiet inside and you're all into the moment, they're magical. They're magical from a learning perspective. They're magical from a, a depth of relationship perspective. And think about it. How many times in a you know corporation, in a team meeting, do team leaders 
do any prep work at the beginning of the meeting to increase the probability that we're going to get in a state where we're truly listening and go have collective flow. And that's the type of transition has to be done in companies. That's the type of work that human development people have to be doing. Putting in place the processes that we're going to use in each meeting that we have a chance to get into a higher level of really having high quality, what I call making meaning conversations. And, but it all comes from listening. Okay, if you don't, I mean, Carl Rogers is, uh, I mean, his work is brilliant. If, if you, if it's only when you truly listen can you have any type of sense of what the uniqueness of the other human being is. One of the things that that's a challenge is through these digital devices. And that's why I look forward to the day when we meet and we can actually sh shake hands rather than elbow bump. <laughs> but uh, it's because you know, there's a there's a saying, um, a guy called Pierre Tyler de Chardin. And he wrote about humanity, and he wrote about us all being connected, etc. Einstein said this, Tesla said this, and there's a, a feel that the more work you do on yourself, that the closer you come to that realization that we're all on, we're all in this together, actually, and we're all connected. And Tyler de Chardin said, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And I truly believe that. And I think that's what you sense in those moments is there's a connection. And then if you take that as a kind of a framing quote, and then here's the content that would come for me under that this is how I write. So this is how I think is there's the law of vibration. So the law of vibration is that, you know, you put two pianos beside each other, you hit a, a note on one and the note on the other will actually resonate at the same frequency. So it's called sympathetic resonance. And I believe that's what we feel in those moments is where we're on the same level. And we even use language like that. We go, Ed's on my same vibe. He's on the same level as me. He understands me. And I think that's where that connection happens. And when that happens, that's what we feel. We feel that unbelievable and very rare, unfortunately, connection. You are 100% right. And there's science behind that. The great work of Barbara Fredrickson in her book, Love 2.0, and not love in a sexual way, love in a platonic way, Love 2.0. She talks about the science of positive resonance, emotional resonance between people when they are either together, communicating, etc. Her science validates what you just said. And that's why it's so important in the business world in teams to accept that science and to basically have practices in meetings. Uh, you know, do a check in, a two, three minute mindfulness meditation or two, three minutes deep breathing before people start. And that check in is, you know, that check in is not, you know, is everybody doing okay? No, you know, how's everybody feeling? Where's your head and where's your heart? Okay, so we know where, where we are. And can we basically get to that point that just what you just said, that point that, that it's flowing between us and it's, it's subparticle, okay? I mean, it's flowing between us and we don't know it, but our bodies know it, okay? Because our, our hormones basically, we can read each other's facial expressions very minutely and pick up hormone. And and so you are spot on, and there's science to it. And and organizations I've worked with, which have trusted me and started doing these types of check-in, check-out processes, these types of engagement processes, they never buy. They never buy in it aggressively or automatically. They humor me and they try it. In most cases. But then immediately, all of a sudden, they're scaling it through the entire company. And you see it when a team is connected. It happens in sport. You mentioned uh, flow. And actually, Cheek sent me how he passed away last week. I don't know if you know that. May he rest in peace. That's the guy who brought us the term flow. But that idea of everybody being in sync or lockstep, it's actually, it's energy in the same, moving to the same rhythm. And that's where 
it's like I often think of an orchestra head that an orchestra that's in symphony you can hear the difference than one that has maybe an egotistical conductor <laughs> who's making them play. And that brings us back to the organization because I wanted to come back to something you said, which is McGregor's work on theory X and theory Y. And just to say to you, one of the amazing serendipities that happens all the time on the show for me is I write a weekly article called The Thursday Thought. And I had written one a couple of weeks ago that went out today that they were recording. But I'd written it before I'd read your work and I'd written about um, what I was calling calling it theory, theory, exploit and theory, explore. But it was based on McGregor's work of, you know, the different mindsets involved. But I was talking about how you need a certain part of theory X, not not the negative parts, but you need the discipline and the rigor. And then you need the theory Y. But you need the theory why when you're creating a business, when you're learning, when you're making mistakes, but also in a world where it's not predictable. Theory X was okay when problems and solutions were defined, when you'd figure things out the year a hundred years ago, industrial evolution. Now I'm not saying that the the autocratic style is okay, but the non tolerance of of mistakes when it comes to rote tasks, etc. But I wanted to bring this back to the environment because you say having the right people with the right learning mindsets, along with theory why leaders and managers that enable and promote learning is necessary. But it's not sufficient to be a HPLO. And the way I kind of saw that combining it with previous guest Amy Hedmondson, is that th that was selecting the right crops, but next we had to create the right soil and actually prepare that soil, etc. And this is creating the right environment. And this comes to processes and procedures. I'd love to share a little bit about that, particularly for those listeners, we have a lot of chief people officers, chief learning officers who listen to the show. What's your advice there for them to create the right conditions? I think the right conditions in, if you will, can be put into some, some boxes, okay? It's how people come to work. And so organizations have got to basically help people take ownership in this fast paced world, ownership and learn how to manage self. I think managing self and coming to the table, all right, in a positive framework is best you can under circ circumstances. Uh, so I, I think that you're going to see more and more companies you know, doing check-in processes where there's either deep breathing or mindfulness meditation. You're going to see more check check-ins around where's people's heads, uh, mind and heart. How are you doing? It's sort of like, you know, have I am I in a good place when I walk in? Training people how to do that. Then I think you're going to have a whole bunch of, uh, you know, checklist and everything. I mean, you know, I, um, I'm. You know, I work with companies and they end up with a meeting management checklist, a critical thinking check, uh, questions checklist, innovative thinking checklist, a, collab a, a listening checklist, a collaboration checklist, after action reviews, mental replay checklist, rapid experimentation processes, mental rehearsal, mental replay. I mean, lots of things that there's processes that you can put in place and you pick the ones which are fit your environment and your business. But it's, 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 we're going to have to, one thing COVID, COVID is awful, but one thing COVID did was COVID made it clear that emotions are in the workplace to organizations. More, more organizations had to deal with the emotional state of their workers in COVID than probably they ever done in their life history as an organization because COVID was a, created emotions, emotions at home, people working at home, young kids, people being sick, whatever, in the, and being then on Zoom and digital and not and dealing with that unknown. But what we've come, come out of it, many companies come out of it learning is, is that we have to be as a, HR, eight, you know, human development group, L and D, we have to be involved in this type of environment because 
it is going to stay volatile as we as technology continues to get faster, faster, bigger, 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 and etc. We're going to have to be involved in the human. Every business, in addition to its core business, is going to be in the business of human development. I believe that. If you're going to if you're going to excel, okay. And there will be many companies that won't do it and will go extinct because it's the human component that's got to be your big differentiator because most of the technology is going to be ubiquitous. There'll be some people that will have leading edge technology, but ultimately it's going to be commercialized and be caught up and everybody will use it. So maybe you're six months or a year behind X, Y, Z. That's not going to put you under. What's going to put you under is, is that the people part of your business my people are not as good as learners, are not as good as collaborators, are not as good as working with clients. They're not as creative. We can't stay up. We're not staying up fast enough. The technology is not going to put you, technology puts you under if you don't do anything. But the technology can be replicated. It's the human side that is unique in individual and in different organizations because it's so people oriented. That's where the focus has got to be. And, and basically, that is, and it's more than basically creating rooms for people to go meditate. We're talking about mindsets, behavior changes, and we're talking about people learning, getting rid of the competition. It's more team. And what's the goal? The goal is not being right. The goal, not me being right, the goal is we as an organization making the best decisions. That means everybody's got to bring their best self to work. And that means we got to have a environment that basically brings that out. And so if whether you want to look at psychological safety, whether you want to look at uh, Edgar Schein's work on humble inquiry, Jane Dutton's work on high quality connections at work, all of this stuff all comes down to how we manage our ego, our mind, our emotions, and our body. Ed, let's give people a few tools to take home with them. And there's there's so many in the book, including the great work of Gary Klein. I won't go deep into the Gary Klein work, which is about critical thinking, intuition, etc. Because Gary's kindly is going to join us in the new year on the show, which is just remarkable and fantastic. Thanks to you, by the way, that's where I discovered Gary's work, brilliant work on challenging our biases, getting the best decisions out of ourselves, etc. So thank you for that, Ed. But I, I'd love to something you mentioned there in passing was AAR's after action reviews, you've done a lot of work understanding the high performance in the army, for example, which is a great institution for performance. Let's share AARs and then perhaps we'll share some more, let's call them softer skill takeaways that people can use. After action reviews are standard in most military operations of the different branches of the, of the U.S. government. And that's where I learned about them. And, uh, you know, they're done by the Army. They're done by the Navy SEALs. And after a mission or after a training, et cetera, the you know, the, the group comes together, say it's like a collaborative team in the business world comes together, okay, uh, that went out and tried to do an experiment, and they ask, what happened? What happened in the experiment? What happened in the, in, when, why did that happen? What worked? What did not work? Why did it not work? What should we do differently the next time? And that process, now that process, all team members are in that process. Rank doesn't count. Everybody answers, okay? And nobody gets defensive because what's the purpose of an after action review? Purpose of an AAR and after action review is how can we be better the next time? What did we learn from this time? All right? And it doesn't take long in the meeting to, to, to do it. I mean, you can even do it in a collaboration meeting, okay? Um, you know, what happened here? All right? What worked, what didn't work? You know, you can even cut it down to three questions instead of six or seven. And it's, it's, a, great, it's a great tool. It's a great tool that you can use yourself. You don't need to be, you know, 
you can go through your day and focus on a meeting I was in or a cl or something I was doing. What happened? Why did it happen? What worked? What didn't work? What can I do differently next time to be better? It works in your marriage. It works in your friendships. You know, what can I do? What can I do differently the next time? Okay. It's, 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 it's a good process. It's a great and it's a great process, as you mentioned there for any relationship, including with your children, like some of the stuff I've learned from several of your books. It's been reinforced, certainly, if I had an inkling of the learning is even that whole idea of, okay, to my sons, you've made that mistake. But why have you made the same mistake twice when you understood it the first time or help? And, and then I'll use the term you gave me, which is help me understand that. So and, um, you know, I, I'm very careful not to be triggering the amygdala, <laughs> if you want to call it that where it's a loaded, it's it's a rhetorical or a loaded question where I'm actually kind of kind of going, you're in trouble now, because he's asking me, help me understand, but I actually genuinely mean, did I not was I not clear in my in my instruction? Or was I not clear in educating you on this kind of thing? And I've made them understand that that's actually the what's with the spirit with which I'm asking the question. But uh, anyway, I, I just wanted to share because AIRs are also useful. Not that I run my home like a like the army, Ed, just to be clear as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely clear. The <laughs> high performance learning environment. <laughs> So uh, HPLF, High per Performance Learning Family. So Ed, and, and I, I mentioned a couple of tools. This one is a really, really good one for critical thinking. I mentioned the work of Gary Klein. I'm going to reserve that for Gary Klein. Ed covers this brilliantly in his book, by the way, in chapter eight and seven and eight, brilliant stuff on critical thinking. But you do mention another book here. And the book is Critical Thinking Tools for Taking Charge of your perf of your professional and personal life by Richard Paul and Linda Elder. And they set forth what you call a critical thinking creed that you find helpful to keep in mind when reading about critical thinking tools, etc. So I'm going to share this and then maybe you to unpack it and then you share your own creed that you mentioned in, in your work. So this critical thinking creed goes as follows, I will not identify with the content of any belief. I will identify only with the way I come to my beliefs. I am a critical thinker and as such, I'm ready to abandon any belief that cannot be supported by evidence and rational considerations. I am ready to follow evidence and reason wherever they lead. My true identity is that of being a critical thinker, a lifelong learner and a person always looking to improve my thinking by becoming more reasonable in my beliefs. I absolutely love that. Ed. I think that's a fantastic way to actually think about any content that you're you're overly identifying with it is a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, little piece by Richard Paul and Linda Elder, and uh, and uh, and that's why I put it in the book. It has it can stand on its own. Uh, people can basically you know find find that creed and. That, you know, that's a nice thing to put in your learning journal or a nice thing to put in your personal journal and, and to read that every morning before you go to work and, to, you know, to read it, read it every night when you come home. OK, it's just because it applies at work and at home. Uh, so it's 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 awesome. And and um, and in, I put that in the learner die book and then that motivated me. Because listening is so important to put a to create a a good listener creed, and I'll share it with you. I'm I am listening to understand and learn, not to confirm. I will listen with an open mind and not rush to judgment or rebuttal. I will manage my thinking and emotions so I can focus on the speaker and what she or he is saying. I believe listening is relational, not transactional, and not competitive. I will do no personal harm to the speaker. I will ask and explore, not just tell. I seek to understand out loud with the speaker before I give advice or react. I will seek to understand out loud with the speaker before I advocate my position. And uh, I think that uh, uh, how we listen 
and what you're on this critical thinking creed, you're, it's how you're defining yourself. If you think about it, it's changing your ego. It's changing your ego. The critical thinking creed says, you know, you are not the content of any belief. That's not you. That's not your heart. Okay. It's your process of how you think that's you. All right. And if you're a good critical thinker, you will always change your beliefs when you get better data. That's the whole concept of an idea of meritocracy in an organization. You know, people, you know, it's, it's so frustrating sometimes when leaders basically say, well, you know, we know more than our people and everything. I mean, our ideas should count for more. I said, well, if you have the right data, if you got the best data, but it should be an idea of meritocracy. And, you know, some leaders get scared about that, that maybe they don't know as much as they know. And then, you know, they look bad if somebody that's two, two levels down the organization comes up with a better idea than them. I mean, I'm sorry. That's idiocy. OK, idiocy. Uh, that's that's what I call in the digital age. That's that's being on the train to extinction. One of the quotes I wanted to share before we wrap up, Ed, and, and I'm going to ask you where people can find you, etc. You have that course coming down the line. It was a quote just to bolster what we just talked about. It's by your colleague at the Darden School of Business, Jean Lidka. And she says of conversations, and I love this, we would all be better off if we treated everything we think of as an assumption to be constantly retested with new data. I love that because that's where my approach entering into a conversation is I'm going to be learning for you. I, I the way I practice this, and I said it to the students, which you kindly gave a, a guest lecture to the students I lecture to in Trinity College. I told them that for me to read their writing. So when they write papers, and I read them, I the the approach I have to that is one of learning, because they're going to find data, and they're going to have opinions that are different to mine. And if I approach that from a learning perspective, I'm going to learn, I'm going to actually learn that. And I think that is a, a beautiful way to kind of consider any opinion that somebody's offering you even and even more so when it's opposite to you. And it, and in and as you say, seek out that opinion when it's the opposite, see why you are so wedded to yours, because there's always something to learn. And it's all about your attitude when you approach those conversations. Jean's a wonderful person. She led the team that that uh, 14 years ago brought me to Darden. Oh, wow. And, uh, and we've, uh, in fact, we just had coffee last um, uh, this past past Monday. And, uh, and we did a lot of a lot of work together. And, uh, and we sort of uh, not split apart personally, but Work-wise, sort of split apart when she decided she wanted to go deep into design thinking, and I wanted to stay in the, the, the work that that I I was in. And uh, but she's a wonderful human being, and she's that is a great great statement that uh, that's there. So thanks to Jean because it's probably how I found you was <laughs> your work in Darden, and she spoke recently at an event I spoke at, by the way, here in Ireland, the IRDG event here in Ireland. So. Um, I, I'm aware of her work in design thinking. Ed, before I throw it to you, I've, I've a little quote that I wanted to finish with to just thank you. But it also, I wanted to just share where people can find you. My website is www.edhess.org. I thought about your work. And you mentioned this, that COVID was an accelerant for so many, th so many trends that were already underway. And COVID was I, I often think of that coin game, you know, where you put the coins in and it falls off the cliff and you win the coins or you don't, that COVID pushed lots of coins off the cliff and, and sent, uh, sent the world very different in a different, in, in a direction it was going, but quicker. And I thought of a Warren Buffett quote for that world. And Buffett famously said, only when the tide goes out, do you discover who's been swimming naked. And many individuals, many organizations have been caught with their pants down. But I felt that we are not going back to there's no going back to the way it used to be ever again. And it's like the tide came in, and then the tide went out again, and it totally reshuffled the tectonic plates of disruption, it 
reshuffle the business landscape. But for me, your work has been so ahead of its time. And I feel when that tide came in, that it left us the gift of your books on the sands, and they were written ahead of it, their time, but now they're of their time. And I wanted to just say that to you. This won't be the last show we do. But I wanted to say that I've learned so much from your work. I've learned so much from the conversations we've had. And it's a great pleasure to call you a friend. And I want to thank you. Well, thank you for those very, very kind words and the feelings of friendship and love are mutual. And our, um, it's, it's just been a joy getting to know you and to be with you as much as I have. And, uh, and you know, I, I leave for our audience and everything. Uh, uh, I sort of give the sign off that I gave in the Learn or Die book. Uh, stay curious, my friends. Awesome. Ed, brilliant, man. Today is my first time thanking the sponsor for the show for the next 12 months. They are Zai a global fintech building integrated financial services for digital native and non native businesses. Please check them out on hellozai.com. 